It is important that we have God's expectations to govern our life. It is only when we are in agreement with God, expecting what He is going to do, then and only then are we going to be found faithful. And that's the best place to be located in, the faithfulness of God. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Romans and chapter 11. Now, God used the Apostle Paul next to Yeshua himself probably more than any other human being. We know that much of the New Testament was written by him. And we know the effects of Paul's revelation that he received through the Holy Spirit still guides the church today. And in chapter 11 of Romans, we see what we should expect in regard to the last days in light of God's covenantal promises. And we could say that differently. Those promises that are going to lead to the establishment of the kingdom. So take out your Bible and let's look together at the book of Romans, chapter 11 and verse 11. Romans chapter 11 and verse 11, where he says, Therefore, I say, now most English translations will put this in the form of a question, and that's fine. But I want you to see what it literally says after we translate it, as most do. We have a word here for, for rebelliousness, a word of failure. And Paul asked the question, have they failed in order that they should fall? And biblically speaking, the word for falling relates to an end. And what Paul's getting to the heart of is this. Has Israel fallen? Has Israel from God's plans and purposes come to an end? And what does he say here? Literally, if we just read the words, Therefore I say to you, they have not fallen or failed, and that they should have fallen. So Paul is saying in the strongest words, even though they have failed, this failure has not caused them to fall. And then he says a very common Pauline expression in Greek, me gineto, which means never let it be. And the reason why he says that is this. If Israel has fallen, if God is finished with Israel, then God's covenantal promises won't be brought about. And that's why he's so sure with these strong words, let it never be. Never think such a thing. Second part of verse 11. But their transgression, and that's literally what that word is. Now, this informs us of something very important. What he's speaking about here is, for the most part, the vast majority of the Jewish community has not accepted the gospel. And what Paul is teaching us is this. Failure to receive the gospel is indeed a transgression. I think that's very important that we see that. And he uses a word several times that relates to a rebelliousness. When we don't agree with God, what Paul is saying is that we are rebelling against him. He says in the last part of verse 11, but their transgression. See, God is able to take whatever he wants. He is sovereign, and God is never the cause of sin. Would you agree with that? God never leads one, causes one to do something that is sinful. God does not sin. God cannot lie, the Bible says, nor does he ever lead anyone to do something sinful. The will of God is never advanced through sin. Make a note of that. Never. 
But God is free to use whatever, including sin, for his purposes. He's not the cause of it. He is not the author of it. And God does not decree sin. I heard someone say, his name is, is Justin Peters. He says in his teaching on the sovereignty of God, that God decrees sin. No, he does not. God never decrees sin. It is never part of his will from the beginning. But God is able to use all things for his glory. Meaning this, God is able to take that which is sinful and use it for that which is good. But again, he's not the cause of it. And what do we see here at the end of, of verse 11? Due to their transgression, salvation has come to who? Nations. That's literally the word there. The nations, the Gentiles. That's fine. Now, when he says that, he is not saying that every Gentile is saved. That would be ridiculous, correct? In this passage of Scripture, and this is important later on, he is speaking about a principle. The gospel came to first the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember that. We're going to see that again taught to us after lunch. But for the most part, that lost sheep were rebellious. They did not receive. They committed a transgression. But God, who is sovereign, has said something. He has said, I am going to use Israel, and we saw it in Genesis 12, to be a blessing to who? All the families of the earth, the nations. And God's call and his giftedness, all of this is not able to be taken back. He is going to use Israel, and therefore he says, even in their transgression." Even in their failure, he says, salvation has come to the nations. And then he writes, in order to provoke them. I would underline that. What does that tell us? It foreshadows something. That this rebelliousness has not brought about the failure and the falling of Israel, but God in his sovereignty, God in his wisdom, has brought about the gospel to the nations being offered to them. And for the remnant of the nations that receive it, the church is going to be a source which provokes Israel to jealousy. So that fact tells us that God has not written off the Jewish people. That he has a purpose for them. Now look at verse 12. But if there, and we could say since, but since their transgression is the wealth of the world. Isn't that what your Bible says? Their transgression did not thwart or bring to an end of God's covenantal endeavors. What he wanted to bring about. In fact, even though they were rebellious, even though they were transgressing, God used that. He's free to use all things in order that his good will, his purposes would be fulfilled. And we see here. That the wealth, that is the gospel, is what he's referring to, has come now not just to the nation, to the world, it says. That's the word that's used here, cosmos. And then he says, and by means of their failure, literally what the word is, by means of their failure, that same word for wealth or richness, Come once more to the nations. So you see what God's saying? He has anointed Israel to be a blessing 
And because of God, hear that carefully, because of God, even when Israel fails and rebels and transgresses, that does not limit God or hinder God from carrying out his purposes. He's always wanted to use Israel to bless the nations, to bring salvation to the world, and that's what he's going to do. But notice what he writes at the end of verse 12. And this is ignored by so many within Christianity today. Paul expects something. Why? Paul knows the prophets. He says here, how much more, isn't that what your Bible says? How much more their fulfillment? What does Paul expect? That in the future, there is going to be a fulfillment of the Jewish people where? In God's plan. We should anticipate something. And that's why I have such a problem with, with theologians that say the fact that there is a nation of Israel today, only the work of man. The fact that, that Jewish people are returning to the land and inhabiting these places that prophets tell us that they will inhabit. The fact that it's occurring today, it's not by chance. It, it's not the will of man. It is God at work for his kingdom purposes because God is faithfulness. See, I have a problem with someone who looks at what's going on and says, this is the work of man, rather than saying, this is God at work today. God is moving in our days. And we're going to see that clearly in our last session this afternoon. So Paul says how much more he anticipates and expects their fulfillment, that they are going to be used to fulfill the purposes of God. Verse 13. For to you I say, now he tells us who he's speaking to, to the nations. Now he's speaking to the nations about Israel. And he says, Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the nations and my ministry, I want to exalt. What is Paul saying? Even though that he's a Jew, he has a special call on his life. In regard to the nations, doesn't mean that he's exclusively to the nations. We see that Paul had the tradition when he went into any city, where did he go first? The synagogue. He spoke to the Jewish people, but we see that there were God-fearers, meaning Gentiles, in that synagogue. And they were the ones who were getting saved. Paul understood, I have an anointing on my life in regard to the Gentiles, well, that shouldn't surprise him because as a Jew, we are called the Jewish people to be a blessing to the nations. And then he says, look now at verse 14. What he wants to do, he says, that same word for how and the implication is for however that I might provoke to jealousy my flesh, meaning fellow Jews, in order that I might save some of them. Now, why is he so interested in saving a portion of the Jewish people? Because he just told us there is going to be that remnant of Israel that is going to be brought into the fullness of God's plan, and that has significance. What type of significance? kingdom significance that has to happen for the kingdom to come now look at verse 15 for since there and it uses word for casting away for if their casting away had an occurrence it brought about something what was that the reconciliation of who the world. Now, again, he's not saying that all the world has been reconciled, but that message of the gospel, that means of reconciliation with God has gone forth out into the world. First, it began with Israel. 
But now God is at work among the nations of the world. He says, if this rejection, this casting away of the Jewish people brought about the reconciliation of the world, he has that same anticipation and expectation. He says, what will their, what's the next word? Acceptance. Don't you see that Paul expects that there's going to be a portion of the Jewish people that accept the gospel? That tells us God is not finished with the Jewish people. That God still has a purpose with that concept of Israel. And that purpose and concept is going to be used in order to bring about the kingdom. And you say, why are you speaking about the kingdom? Well, look again at the last part of verse 15. He says, what will be their acceptance? He tells us exactly. Life from the dead. What is that? Can you summarize that in one word? Resurrection. And you will find that the term resurrection has kingdom implications. I can only have a kingdom hope because Christ rose from the dead. Resurrection is inherently related to the kingdom. What he's saying is this. When Israel is reconciled to God, every Jewish person, no. But when Israel, that remnant in the last day, is reconciled to God through the gospel, there's only one way to be reconciled to God, correct? When that remnant of Israel through the gospel is reconciled, then we should expect the kingdom to come. Now, let me go off on a tangent for a moment. As you know, we live in Israel, and there's many different ministries in Israel. And I think the vast majority are doing excellent work. But there's one group, and I like them. I think they're sincere, but I think they miss this point. Because this is what they teach. They teach that when Israel gets reconciled to God, that there's going to be brought about the greatest revival in the world that's ever been. Now, what's the basis for that? Well, they do that same thing that I warn you never to do, and that is to be guided by logic and the rational mind rather than Scripture. They're saying it this way. If we go back 2,000 years ago and Israel's rejection brought about salvation being offered to the world and we see the church today then they think to themselves when Israel gets right with God oh my there is either going to be a greater revival but the scripture doesn't say that that's not what Paul anticipated now many people and I'm going to challenge you to do something the Bible speaks about 144,000 now, we know that first group in chapter 7 of Revelation are 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, those 12 tribes. I realize that Dan does not appear there, but Manashe does, but we have 144,000. And let me tell you what some people say, and there's no biblical basis for this. And I know that this is going to be upsetting to some, but you will hear preacher after preacher tell you, that these 144,000 are Jewish. They are Jewish in Revelation 7. Jewish evangelists. Have you ever heard that? Can anyone here give me the verse of Scripture that says that this 144,000 are evangelists? I don't know of any verse. I know what people say, a cause and effect, but it's not biblical. In fact... In Revelation chapter 14, where this 144,000 are mentioned again, I would suggest to you that it's a different group of people, that they're spoken of differently, but putting that aside. When you look at, and I'll give you a verse, Revelation 14 and verse 6, the one who has that gospel to proclaim is an angel. 
There is not any verse of scripture, and I don't mind being proven wrong. I've been married 37 years. I've been proven wrong a few times. I can handle that. I have no problem admitting to a group of people, you know what? What I said was wrong. Because my objective is to share truth. And if I've shared something that's not, I want to correct it. Because the Bible says teachers are going to be judged more severely. So I never have a problem admitting I'm wrong. But I don't know of any verse of scripture that says these 144,000, whether we're talking about Revelation 7 or Revelation 14, I don't know of any verse that says that they are evangelists. It's just not in the scripture. And it is faulty biblical methodology that arrives at that conclusion based upon rational thought rather than the word of God. Why I'm emphasizing this is because of this reason. When Israel gets right with God, what should we expect? The kingdom, not this great time of evangelism and revival. When Israel accepts, what should we expect? Life from the dead, the establishment of the kingdom. Look now to verse 17. I know that we skipped verse 16. Read it, but for the sake of time. He talks about the world, meaning the non-Jews, and Israel. He says in verse 17, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, so these branches that were broken off, were, were the Jewish branches, those that were part of the nation of Israel. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, now he's speaking to the nations, and he uses a term for the wild olive tree, you being grafted in among them. Notice that, among them. You know what that tells us? There has always been Jewish people part of the church. Always. And you, being that wild olive tree, were grafted in. And he says, among them. And also, fellow partakers. It's a word of communion. Communion with the root. The root supplies all the nutrients, the good things, and not just the root, but also the fatness of that olive tree you have become. So he's saying here, the blessings that God had for Israel, the church becomes full participants in receiving those same blessings, correct? There, there is ultimately no difference in Christ. Now, there's Jew and Gentile, but the benefits of salvation are the same for all people. And he says, look now at verse, verse 18. He warns the church, do not be boastful against the branches, these natural branches, the Israel branches. But, but if you boast, realize something. You do not bear the root, but it's the root that bears you. That, that special olive tree that you've been grafted into, that root bears you. Verse 19. Therefore you say, they, those branches, those natural branches, part of Israel, they have been broken off in order that I have been grafted in. Well, what does he say? Look now at verse, verse 20. He uses a word, good or well. And that word is always related to the will of God. That shouldn't surprise us. We go back to our first lesson, Genesis 12. God spoke to Avram. He says, I'm going to make you a great nation. And what is the purpose of that nation? We've heard it several times. To bless who? 
all the families of the earth. That's God's desires. All the nations of the earth. God wants those same blessings that he offered to Abraham that motivated him to respond. He wants that same response, those same blessings too be available and to be received by all of humanity with no difference whatsoever. This is what he's saying in this passage. So he says, good. And then he tells us, what was the problem with Israel? He says, verse 20, with unbelief, or we could say by unbelief, they were cut off. But you, this is a very important uh, conjunction. It's a conjunction of contrast. But you, with faith or by faith, you what? You stand. Now, you may not know it, but in the scripture, we see it so many places. When someone is called by God to stand, that is a call to service. When God says to you, rise up, just just doesn't mean get up, but go to work. So when I read that, looking at the wealth of Scripture, and he says here, by faith you stand. He is calling the church to go to work, to be busy in God's kingdom purposes. And he also says, middle of verse 20, do not be haughty, do not be prideful. Do not be boastful, but do what? Fear. Now, that's a great word, fear. Because biblically speaking, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that word fear relates to the priorities of God. When you are living and being motivated and led by the fear of the Lord, you are being committed to the priorities of God. We can say it differently. You are basing your life upon the purposes of God. This just reinforces what we learned earlier when he says, by which you stand, get to work. Be committed to the priorities of God. Verse 21. But if God, the natural branches, he did not, Spare. This is a word that relates to mercy. See, God, and the Bible says this many places, both Old and New Testament, God is not a respecter of persons. Meaning, if he looks at you, not because of who you are, what people you belong to, what's your race, or anything like that. That doesn't impress God. God does not deal, he does not have any favorites. When it talks about Israel being the chosen people, that choice is a call to service. It's a call to be used by God. So here he says, when you talk about those natural branches, meaning Israel, God did not spare them. He didn't show them a special mercy. And he says, likewise, nor to you, Will he be merciful or spare? Now, what he's saying here is this. And remember what I said earlier. When he's talking about the world and he's talking about the nations, he's simply speaking about that gospel being offered. He's not making the assumption, Paul is not making the assumption when he speaks about the nations or the world that all of them are saved. He's simply saying that that gospel, due to the rejection, the rebelliousness, and the transgression of Israel, all of Israel, no, there's always been that remnant of believers throughout history. But by and large, the majority of the Israel nation has rejected, and they have been momentarily cut off. Why? What did we learn in verses 12 and 15? That there should be an expectation of what? Restoration. And that restoration has to happen in order that the kingdom would come. Let me share with you, we'll be talking more about this in our last session. 
the enemy hates the kingdom. Because when that first expression of the kingdom, I'm speaking of the millennial kingdom, happens, where's Satan during that time? He is bound where? In the abyss, in prison, in hell. He doesn't want that. He likes it right now. And Satan hates God's plans. Because God's plan of his people, covenantal victory, that's what we have to look forward to. Victory according to the covenantal standards, the covenantal agreement. We're going to experience victory, and our victory is defeat. You know, one of the things I love, when you look at Revelation chapter 20, now, there are some pretty important angels in the Bible, right? I can think of two. One is Gavriel. That name, Gavriel, comes from a Hebrew word which means might, strength, power. So Gavriel, Gabriel, is the mighty angel of God. But he's not one of the archangels. There's only one archangel. I know that if you Google on the internet, they'll say both Michael and Gabriel are archangels. No, there's only one archangel. The word ark in Hebrew or in Greek means ruler. There's only one ruling angel. And who is it? Michael. So you have Michael and Gabriel, both strong angels. Now, in my mind, I think one of them should, should capture Satan, right? And throw him in. But the scripture doesn't say that. What was the name of the angel? We're not even given an angel name. It just says an angel, not a particular one, not a special one, not a powerful one. Just an angel seizes Satan and casts him into the prison. That's what the Bible says. Why? He's already been defeated. It doesn't take this supernatural angel. Any angel can deal with Satan because he has been defeated. That's the good news that we have. So he tells us here in the scripture that Israel has not experienced being spared, being merciful to, nor will God do so for you. Look now at verse 22. Therefore, what's the next word? Behold. That word behold means pay attention. Whenever the word behold appears in a biblical passage, something significant is going to happen or be revealed. He says, therefore, behold, the kindness and the severity of God. Now, that's God's nature. With God, God functions in what we could call a dichotomy, right? He deals with darkness and light, good and evil, kindness or severity. There's nothing what? In the middle. You never find God in the middle. God does not compromise. Why? Because God does that which is perfect, and his plans are perfect, not ours. There's no compromising with God in a general sense. So when we look at God, it says here, verse 22, Therefore, behold, meaning this is significant, the kindness of and the severity of God. Now, in this next part of this verse, we see a very common Greek construction. We know it as Greek grammars. We talk about mende. Mende is two Greek words that when they are used like this, what they are presenting is, well, you've heard the expression, on one hand this, and on the other hand, this, this is how mende is used in Koine Greek. So he gives two possibilities. He says here, look again at verse 22. On one hand has fallen severity. Who would that be placed upon? Who has severity fallen upon? Israel. But upon you... Now, he says, I'm speaking to the nations. So he says, but 
upon you kindness. Why? Now here again. I do not know why so many English translators love to minister doubt. Doubt's not a good thing. What does James says? A doubtful person is going to be unstable. He is going to be easily moved aside. And they should expect, a doubtful people should not expect anything from God. See, this word in Greek, it's really not if, but it's better translated since. See, we should have an expectation for God's covenant people of faithfulness. And he says here, since you remain in the kindness, but if not, then you too will be what? Cut off. Now, he's not talking about salvation here. What he's saying is this. This gospel, remember what I've said three times. This gospel is being offered to the nations. That's who he's speaking of. And he says, if you remain in faithfulness, then you're going to experience the kindness of God. But those nations that don't remain in this, that don't take hold of the gospel, that are not believing, that are not faithful like Abraham, then they too are going to be cut off. Why? God doesn't deal one way with the nations and one way with Israel. It's the same. So Israel was offered kindness, rejected it, they were cut off. Now that same gospel is being offered to the world. It's the richest for the world, but if you don't receive it, you will be cut off from the promises of God. That's what he's saying. Now look at verse 23. But also they... If they do not remain in unbelief. And literally, it's that same word we could translate since they will not remain in unbelief. Now, why we should translate that word since is because we're going to see God is faithful. And God is going to work in the last days to bring a remnant of Israel to faith. We should expect that. Because if that doesn't happen, and if that faithfulness is not demonstrated, then what won't come? Zion, great answer, the kingdom. Zion is a kingdom word. Zion is Jerusalem after redemption. Experiencing the consequences and the outcome of redemption. So he says, and they... Since they will not continue in unbelief, they will be grafted in. Why? For God is able again to graft them in. That's what he's going to do. Verse 24. Now, more than any other verse, I've worked harder on this verse because the Greek and the grammar Very difficult. So I'm going to do my best to translate it properly. Verse 24. For if, and it's a different word, it's not the word aeon as we've been encountering, but it's the word a in in Greek, and it means if. For if you, he wants to review what he's just taught. For if you from the natural wild olive tree have been cut out and contrary to nature grafted into this good olive tree. So he says, haven't you experienced something? You were of a different stock. You were of a different people. You were not a covenant people. You were not part of Avraham. That was Israel. But nevertheless, God who is able to do, what's God able to do? All things. All things is possible with God. So he says, God was able to, against what's natural, against what's nature, 
He was able to cut you out of that wild olive tree and graft you into this good olive tree. And the fact that he did that should tell us something. And that is what? How much more so they. Now, this is the third time that Paul has written something that should inform the readers that there's going to be an end times restoration of the remnant of Israel. All the Jewish people? No. But a remnant. And that's why the Jewish people going back to the land and the fact that there is a nation having been reestablished is not the outcome of man's work, but God is at work. We need to recognize that. So he says in the verse 24, how much more so they, the ones that according to nature, are being able to be grafted into, grafted into what? Their own olive tree. It's easier. Not that anything's difficult for God. But it is easy to graft one type of branch back into the type of tree that it originated from. So that's why he says, how much more so they are going to be grafted in to one's own olive tree. Now, Here's what Paul does next. He gives us a prophetic verse to tell us and give us the right understanding of how this is going to happen and when this is going to happen. Now, he says, look at verse 25. For I do not want you to be, what does your Bible say? Ignorant. Now, ignorant... Perhaps that means unknowing, but in Greek, it's really not the word for ignorant, but it's the word for knowing something and this preposition, ah, which means against. So what Paul literally says here is this, I don't want you to be against knowing this. Why? I think much of the church, not all, but much of the church is against what God's up to, what God is doing, what God has promised to do, what his word attests. He says here, for I do not want you to be against knowing. Who's he speaking to? Brothers. Means brothers and sisters, brethren. I don't want you to be against knowing this church. And then he speaks about this mystery. What mystery is it? In order that you, and here again, if you look at the literalness, it says, par eftos, which means from oneself, and the next word, your Bible probably says wise, but it's not the word for wisdom, that is sophia. It's a word for thinking. And this is what he's warning us. And I think it is great counsel. He basically says, I don't want you to be thinking for yourselves. That's literally what it means. Don't think for yourselves. That is an expression which means rely upon Scripture. Trust and base your thoughts upon my revelation. You are not going to get to this in a rational mind. It is only through God's revelation that you're going to understand this. And what does he say? Verse 25, second part. Because the hardening. It's a word which means something that becomes difficult. That which becomes hard. Notice what it says. This Hardness, apomeros. What does that mean? In part. It is a partial hardening. It hasn't happened to every Jewish person. I'm an example of that. There's many Jewish believers, both in Israel and outside of Israel. And that number is 
growing. And there is more and more openness. And I'll tell you why. October 7th. It was shocking spiritually. Why? Because the rabbis all over the world, both in Israel and abroad, they all had a view that was very popular, very pleasing to hear, but totally non-prophetic. See, Judaism of the rabbis, they look at prophecy as different possible scenarios. Did you know that? See, we don't, and you ought not. I believe all of the prophets, what they say in all of Scripture in general, will be fulfilled. Do you believe that? You ought to. Judaism does not. Judaism looks at prophecy and says prophecy speaks about different scenarios. Perhaps it will be this scenario. If not, it will be this scenario. If not, it will be this one. They see a variety of different possibilities prophetically. I totally reject that. And what they say is this, that all the negative prophecies, for example, the battle of Gog and Magog, that's in the future. They say that has been canceled out. And all these prophetic things talking about the suffering of the Jewish people in the last days, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Etzrahile Yaakov, a time of trouble or tribulation for Israel. What did the rabbi say? Canceled away. Won't happen. People want to hear that. But what took place on October 7th? The worst, what we call pogrom, a, a attack against the Jewish people. It was the worst one since... World War II from the Shoah. And that was very unsettling because it goes against what the rabbis were promising. Now, that has created an opportunity for me and others like me to say, we ought not listen to men. We should not think according to ourselves. That's dangerous. We need to rely upon the scriptures. The scripture says something very, very different. And the rabbinical approach to prophecy is not correct. What does Paul say? Look now at verse 25 at the end. He says this hardening has happened to Israel, but only partially, only in part, not fully. And this hardening is going to continue. Notice what the scripture says. Until the fullness of the Gentiles enter in. Now, that is such an important term. By the way, that same term for fullness appears in verse 15. But not in regard to the Gentiles, but in regard to who? Israel. Now, we need to understand biblical terms. I want to focus a moment on the term Israel. Now, most of the world hears Israel and puts a, a Jewish definition to it. We ought not. Let me give you a verse of scripture. Look sometime at Genesis chapter 28 and verse 3. There it says that Israel, he's speaking to Yitzchak, Isaac. And he reveals, this is Moses talking, but God is speaking. Moses is writing it down. And there in Genesis 28 and verse 3, it says that Israel is going to be a kahal, that is a congregation. Kahal, amim. What's amim? Peoples. Am is another word for a nation. So Israel, biblically, according to the Torah, is going to be a congregation of nations, of peoples. That shouldn't surprise us. Because ultimately, and remember I mentioned N.T. Wright, I agree with him. That the promises of God that were made to Abraham a blessing, 
can only be found in Christ, correct? There's no other way. But here's the problem. What, what he wants to derive from that, and he's not alone, much of the church does this, is to say all of those promises, they were offered to Israel, I agree. They were rejected, I agree. And therefore, they're rendered null and void for the Jewish people. That we should not anticipate God working anymore in the land or among that people. That's false. Prophecy demands God has said, I'm going to bring the people back to the land. He's doing it. And he's going to do it. Read Ezekiel 37. Beginning in verse 21, 22. God is bringing the Jewish people back to the land. And he's doing that in their, what Ezekiel says, in their idolatry, in their impurity, in their defilement. What does that tell us? He's bringing them back, not because they deserve it. He's doing it because of who he is. Because he's going to use Israel in the last days to show himself to the world. Why? Read the last verse of Ezekiel 37. It says, when the nation sees how God sanctifies Israel in the last days, and why does he do it? Because he's a covenant-keeping God. When the nations see that, guess what they're going to do? They're going to respond to God. They are going to see God's faithfulness and say, we want to accept a God like that. God is going to use Israel even in the last days. There will be a remnant, not some great end times revival that some teach and, and speak about. Because what does the scripture say? Well, look at verse 26. It says, the hap, the end of verse 25 first, this hardening has happened to Israel in part until the fulfillment or the fullness of the Gentiles enter in. That means come to salvation, now verse 26, and thus all Israel. Now, what does all Israel mean? All Israel does not mean every Jewish person. All Israel, he's just defined it. Genesis 28.3, it's a congregation of peoples. He says there's going to be the fullness of the nations, right? They've got to enter in, and those nations are who? The Gentiles. God loves Gentiles too. Israel exists to bless the Gentiles. But God says, I'm not done just with the nations. I'm going to pivot in the last days. This is what the scripture is saying. When the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, come in what is God going to do? He is going to pivot to who? Israel. Because he's faithful. He keeps all of his covenant promises. And he says, just as it is written. Don't you like that? God acts in accordance to what has been written by who? The prophets. And now we're quoting the scripture from Isaiah 59, verse 20 and 21. And by the way, that scripture, and I don't think this is by chance, that scripture from Isaiah 59, verse 20 and 21 is read every day, recited every day in the morning service except for Shabbat. On Shabbat, it's recited, but at the conclusion of the afternoon service. It's one of the few scriptures that every day, if you go to synagogue, you say it, you hear it. Because it's foundational. It's a message of hope. He says, just as it's been written, the Redeemer. Who's the Redeemer? Messiah. The Redeemer will come out of Zion. Now that word out means for the purpose of Zion. What's Zion? We heard it a few minutes ago. It's a kingdom word. The Redeemer is going to come for the purpose of Zion for the kingdom. And he is going to do something. He is going to turn away the ungodliness. And that word, I would encourage you to do a good study of it. 
We translate it ungodliness. But it's everything that is against holiness. Everything that is against the proper worship of God. Everything that is against the character of God. Messiah is going to make a change. Let me ask you. Didn't you need a change in your life? Weren't you thinking incorrectly? And didn't God, by his grace, through the blood of Messiah, work a change in your life? Yes. Well, he's going to do that same thing to Israel because of who he is. He says, the Redeemer will come out of Zion and turn the ungodliness from Yaakov. And what is he going to establish? He says, verse 27, our last verse. And this is my covenant. Now, if you know anything about Hebrew, whenever, this is Greek, but it's quoted from the Old Testament, from verse 21. And whenever the word zot, which is the female for this, Hebrew has both masculine and feminine. Zay is masculine, zot is feminine. And whenever the feminine stands by itself, it's emphasizing something. He says, this, this word, this means my primary purpose, my main thing. And it's a covenant. He says, and this is my covenant with, with them. Whenever, we don't know when, but it's going to happen. Whenever. I have turned away from, from them. What's he going to turn away? Sin. I'm going to turn away their sin. And why is he going to do that? For a kingdom purpose. That's what God's up to. And in my impression, when I look at the world, it's not by chance what's taking place. We see, and we're going to focus on this in our last lesson, we see anti-Semitism at an all-time high. In fact, scholars much smarter than me says it's the highest sense, Nazi Germany. Similar to it. That shouldn't surprise us. Because we're going to see biblically there's going to be a returning back to that same Nazi philosophy in the last days. Don't believe me. Let's look at what John in the book of Revelation writes. And what we're going to do. It's almost 1230. That's the time that we break for lunch. And having spoken for over 30 years. I've learned one principle. And that is this. Never keep lunch waiting. Never. You can preach the best message, and if you're one minute late for lunch, no one likes it. So we're going to break at 1230. But let me just simply say to you that God is going to show himself faithful, perfectly faithful, to exactly what his word reveals. And we need to be just like Rahab. And we're going to introduce, and it's a short message. After lunch, because people are tired after lunch, and we have a short message, 30 minutes tops, but that last message may be a little bit longer. We're going to meet a Canaanite woman who, biblically, according to Yeshua, she is the perfect example of what God wants you to be. Imagine that. Do you understand how shocking that is for a Jewish person to say, there is a Canaanite woman who is the perfect example of what God wants all of his disciples to be. That, that's hard to get our heads around. A Canaanite woman? But who remembers what the word Canaanite, Canaan, means? Submit. If you want to be a glorious example before God, Learn how to submit. And what we're going to focus in on after lunch are the benefits of submitting to the word of God.
It may seem difficult. It may seem uncaring at times. It may seem harsh. But when you submit, you are going to be amazed at the change that God ministers unto you. Father God, we thank you that you are a powerful God, a faithful God, a covenant-keeping God. And Lord, we pray that we might be changed, that we might become ever more submissive to your truth, your word, your revelation. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.